Welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Morgan Devon. I'm joined by the fabulous Jacqueline Johnson. We've been friends for a long time. A long time. And there's so many things going on in her life. So this is going to be a little bit of a girl boss chat. I don't even, can we say girl boss? Is there too much stigma with the frame uh, I, I girl boss these days? at this point. Like, it's fine. I need a new term. Ugh. Okay. Anyways, we'll come back to that. But we're going to talk about all things business. Jacqueline had her incredible company, Create and Cultivate, acquired a few years back. And she recently bought it back. And I want to know all the tea. <laughs> we talk a lot in this podcast about setting yourself up to be acquired and what that can look like. And oftentimes the guilt, the pain, the stress, and all the things that you don't expect, there's some negative stuff to being acquired. Okay. And, you know, I've acquired three businesses in the last, I don't know, 10 years. And we always go through with whoever we acquire, like some sort of like regret, remorse. And I would actually say, I think almost all of them would buy it back if they could. Mm, you know? Interesting. I love that take. So, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah they can't. But, they, but if they could, they would. You know what I'm yeah. So I'm like, well, yeah, it's not just because it looks good now because we fix it. But you never know. So we're going to get into that today. I love it. And last but not least, Jacqueline lives an incredible life, at least from outside looking at it. It looks like you have really found different ways to find joy and balance. And so we'll talk a little about that journey as well. I love it. I can't wait. We have so much to catch up on. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Where would you like to start? Oh my God, I mean, your call, your call. Okay, let's start with the news. Okay. So... Last week, you announced that you bought back Create Cultivate. You have a new CEO, which you've been like talking and sharing her with us. Marina. Yeah. Marina. Yeah. I didn't know of her before. So I, you know, saw her through you. She looks lovely. So it seems <laughs> super smart. And then you just dropped like a giant bomb. <laughs> Truly like a bomb. But also, like, if you had told me two years ago, like, you're going to be buying your company back, I would have been like, no, no way. Yeah. Absolutely no way. And yet here we are. So basically, just for context for the listeners, I had the company for like truly 100 years. I mean, I was like 10, 11 years-ish in to run and create and cultivate, completely bootstrapped, no venture right. funding at all, completely self-funded. You know, I would say 2019 crushing it. Like, I mean, I want like as much of this as like 2019 energy because I'm like, I miss it. You know, yeah, we, like, were all set all up. we were all set up for <laughs> such an incredible 2020. I, totally. I remember it like it was yesterday. The heyday. It oh, really was so the heyday. Good. So ended 2019, you know, 4 million EBITDA, 14 million in revenue, mm -hmm. 2020 Q1, $5 million quarter. And then Let's we all know go. what happened. Yeah. COVID. Which for any entrepreneur, I think we're all kind of now experiencing the PTSD of what that year was because we all went into overdrive to save our businesses yeah. and, you know, figure out how to pivot. Mm -hmm. And luckily, we actually did a really good job, I think. You know, we pivoted to digital really quickly. We're able to translate our audience. We're able to expand internationally, salvage sponsorship dollars. And so we ended the year, you know, surprisingly very well. Nine million revenue, like three million EBITDA. So it's like still bad. for 2020, That's not great. bad for a literal events company. That's yeah. like what we were. Right. And so, you know, obviously there was a bunch of people over the beginning of 2020. We had a lot of interest in acquisition from different buyers in, in the $40, $50 million valuation range. I was like, I'll see you in, in San Tropez. Let's go. Like, I'm on a yacht. We're on a yacht. <laughs> I'm on a Let's yacht. Let's fucking go. I'm on a yacht. And then I'm like, we're gonna we're gonna flatten the curve, everyone. We're gonna flatten. No, we aren't. No, we're not. Absolutely not. No, absolutely <laughs> not. So after that, that was devastating. And then obviously off the table for any acquisitions. Of course, everyone came knocking for fire sales. Like yeah. you know, it was everyone. Like every big company mm -hmm. tried to take advantage of that moment. And I was like, absolutely not. Like we are going to sell, and we are going to make money off this deal because. You know, as a bootstrap founder, you put all your money into the company yeah. um, and you kill yourself to make it yeah, successful. Yeah, your net worth is your company. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so basically, you know, ending the year like that, it was a great story. There was a lot more interest from the private equity side versus acquisition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was down to a few different people and we ended up going with one firm and you know they took a majority stake i still had a small amount of equity they injected capital into the business which it needed at that point right brought on a new ceo who was wonderful mm -hmm. and i took a step back right which is what you do like all the way back all the way back yeah so i was on the board and then obviously still hosted the podcast but was not involved in the day-to-day -day whatsoever right but was like supportive of obviously everything that was going on but i needed it i needed a break mm -hmm. like i 
you know, had explained that to them, you know, I was exhausted. Right. I was burnt out. I also was the bottleneck for the business. You're solo founder. Totally. It's hard. And like you become, you know, you know where all the bodies are buried. You know how to do everything in the company. And there's no way to scale that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I knew I needed to step back for the company to grow and build. And um, I did. I took a big step back. I got a house in Napa. I uh, gardened. I worked out. I cooked. Yeah. I took like sommelier courses. So like good. I did all the like retiree life stuff. So, so weird to wake up and like not have a million fires to put out, yeah. not have a bunch of emails, like the Instagram likes drop, you know, right. whatever. But I was like, okay with it. But it is a personal identity crisis. Like Mm -hmm. you spend 10 plus years of your life waking up and doing something and to wake up one day and not is a weird feeling. Yeah. And to also discover who you are outside of that. Like, what do I like? Mm -hmm. What do I like to do? Mm -hmm. How do I show up in the world now that I'm not this person that people know me as? Mm -hmm. But it's tricky, right? Because a lot of people didn't know that I had left. So I think Mm -hmm. there was this audience perception of like, she's still doing it and still running it. Yeah. Because you were still like signal boosting it and like sharing it. Promoting it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just so funny because I'd get like these DMs like, hey, I'm outside. I'm the florist. Like, can you let me? And I'd be like, oh, I don't know. I'm not. It's not me anymore you know or like I'm I want a job but like you know that perception is also blurred so it's like this weird existence of of living in the gray area in terms of like how people see you versus like who you are what you're doing and also it's challenging you know so it's like I started posting a lot about like this new life Mm -hmm. which like you enjoyed but everyone else was like give us the business shit like we don't you're like I'm on the other side I'm on the other side yeah exactly but then that's weird right because you're like well well, how do I show up like what what do people you know what's it's interesting so Did that. And then um, just kind of had a wild couple of years. Like I got divorced. I was with someone for 10 years. Wow. So it was like 10 year business, 10 year really. It was the end of an era in a lot of ways. So it was like kind of this weird rebirth, I guess, in a way of like, what do I want my life to look like? I'm 38 years old now. You know, I was 23 when I started my first company. Wow. Entrepreneurship is like a long journey. Yeah. And so to wake up and kind of be like, okay, I'm in this place like financially now where I'm I'm good. You do whatever you want. Which is a different, you know, feeling than when you're bootstrapped, you know, struggling yeah. to build it or hustling to build it and all those things. So I can do whatever I want. What does that look like? What lights me up? Like, what do I enjoy? And I started realizing like, I really like working with founders and I really enjoy helping other founders secure funding, learn more about fundraising, learning about selling businesses, because it is kind of an insular secret world where people don't share this information as freely. No, the fact that you even dropped like your numbers, I was like, oh, we can get into it early. <laughs> because people are just so, no, so like scared. hush hush. They don't want to say the things, you know. No, so, yeah. I'm proud of it. Like, I'm really proud of it. Like we were a, like, I was a random person with an idea and to like do that is crazy. Like. And I think it's like, unless you feel like you're running a billion dollar business, you shouldn't be talking about numbers, but like, no, be proud of yourself. The fact that we were so profitable and self-funded is insane. So it was great. So basically now on the other side of it, I started coaching a little bit, like, you know, just by kind of accident, honestly, I was on an app called intro and was doing these like, you know, little 15 minute sessions and turned into this thing. And I really enjoyed it. And ended up meeting Marina. Mm. So Marina's been in the coaching space for a long time, personal branding, all of that masterminds, that whole world, which I know nothing about. Mm -hmm. And she was basically like, you should do a mastermind. And I was like, no. I was like, you know, it feels like MLM. Like, yeah. I don't Outside know. I was looking in as like, not real entrepreneurs, but that's how we no, think but of totally. it. No, like, Real entrepreneurs, we don't need to do I literally said that. I, I go, I don't know one person who's actually built a company who's done it. And she's yeah. like, well, I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. And I said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I said, if I can find one other like really credible entrepreneur to do it with me, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And so I call Allie. Allie, Allie Webb from Drive Love Bar, Allie. the best. And I was like, do you want to do this thing with me? She's like, I don't know. And I was like, let's just do it. Like, let's yeah. do it. And it's been so awesome. Like, we've had the best time. I don't think like whatever a mastermind is, I don't even know if we're that. But like, right. we basically have gotten together with this group of women and started Blueprint Mastermind. We work so well together. Like. It, the women are amazing. I've enjoyed it so much because I think it's also what I've realized in building, create, and cultivate is I was never in intimate groups. Mm. It was always thousands of people, mm-hmm. always hundreds of people. Right, at the event. And I never got, to, like, I knew our community, but I never got to, like, know our community in right. a way where I'm like, oh, tell me about your business. How's it going? What are your right. struggles? Right. And I just got so much insight into it. And I realized in running the Blueprint, like, oh, I kind of miss it. Mm. And I got an itch, but I never thought, like, anything about it. And long story short, um, you know, it was sort of the end of the year. There had been some interest in acquiring Crate and Cultivate. There was conversations amongst the board and like what was kind of happening. And obviously the market was a little tricky. 
And it kind of came about naturally, like when they were talking about the sale. Because at first I was like, okay, who who is a good strategic right. that we can like align with? Now just to level set, because you sold to private equity, there's always going to be some sort of resale. Yeah. So second, just, second sale, just yeah. for everyone's, you know, education, like when you private equity firms are designed to streamline a business, add value, squeeze out as much as they can, that could mean good or bad things. Mm-hmm. And then sell it for a higher than what they bought it as. Yes. It's not a holding keepsies. Yes, exactly. Okay. It's not a holding keepsies. And I think like, you know, with this specific business, I don't think they understood how valuable I was to the business. Like when we had like gone through the, the they acquisition. Missed. Yeah. And listen, like I tried to stay for a little bit because you're like, oh, I don't want to let go. Yeah. But honestly, it was like one of those things where I was like, you know, I'd love to have a seat at the table if we're going to talk about selling. And at first, everyone was like, what the hell are we talking yeah. about? And um, I was like, no, listen, like, no one else knows this business better than I can. Yeah. Like, I, I understand it and I see it. And I think I also realized, like, I was like, we're in a different world now. Like, when Creighton Cultivate launched, it was like Creighton Cultivate, Refinery29, you know, all, like, the media powerhouses. Yeah. Everybody was winning. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then you see this shift to personality-driven content, so like Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow, Girl Boss with Yamoroso. Then you see it even more so on TikTok, you know, and now everything, Alex Earls, and and now Unwell, and and Call Her Daddy, and and it's like the talent's driving the brand. The brand's not driving the talent anymore. And so I think for Create and Cultivate, you know, even though I think out of a lot of those companies that were around us, like we did really well, we had so much amazing talent, but we had no face, like in a way, which was like me kind of, but like I was an actual operating CEO. Yeah, right. So I was like, I think we need to go back to like that talent led lens and be more nimble, less media company. And that was sort of my philosophy on it. And obviously bringing, you know, fresh, amazing blood like Marina and like whoever who are like, again, different space but know how to monetize an audience because we had been so heavily reliant on sponsorship. B2B. That's right. And that's was our bread and butter. And it was like a great business, but it's fickle. It is. It's, you know, this It's very fickle. Yeah. So you, you win and you lose. Yeah. But you know, who doesn't and you have away. to, and you yeah. have to buy, they have to, you have to convince them every year, every year. So it's not like, Oh, every I have year. a multi-year, like you're going to always Alec. No, every year we start at zero. Every year you start at zero. And so like, that's a tough business, Mm -hmm. but monetizing your audience is actually strong revenue and delivering on that recurring revenue. And that's something that like, I never wanted to do with Create and Cultivate because I was like, I want the audience to get as much information, have as much opportunity as possible. Like we'll monetize that. But what I mistook was like, they actually want to spend and And they want to spend on more, on different types of experiences that are more granular, especially now. Yes. And we had missed the concept of growing up with our audience, I think. And I look back now and I'm like, okay, here I am, you know, sold a business, bought a business, been on the venture side, angel invested, blah, 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 all the sides of things. And then I realized being in the room, there's other women like me that, you know, want to educate themselves. So our new philosophy is around launch to legacy and helping female entrepreneurs through that journey. Because I don't think when I started creating Cultivate, it was like, I was in the same place as them. I was like, let's launch this, let's do it. And like everyone had that same launch energy, but we're past that now. Mm-hmm. And we have women, you know, IPOing, raising, you know, tons of venture, da, 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 whatever. It's like, oh, let's tell a different story. So, so that's the new focus. I love but it. But damn, <laughs> I did not know. That was a lot. That was a lot. Circle. Circle I know. of life. Circle of life. Okay. So Blueprint Mastermind is now a part of creating Cultivate. Cultivate. That was a piece I didn't fully get. I was like, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? That makes more sense. And I also, I think that is actually, I'm processing in real time live, y'all. So bear with me. But I, I do think that that is the future of these media companies. Agreed. You know, Blavity, we have both businesses. We have Afrotech, which is consumer driven. We just bought a party brand. We're building a music festival Amazing. built on top of that brand so we can have a more consumer focus with our event strategy instead of just sponsors. Yep. Now, I've always struggled with this idea of charging our consumer. Like, you know, I never wanted to charge for our content yep. on blavity.com, like, you know, Wikipedia, another group, The Guardian, they'll run like a it's contribution amazing. campaign, you know. I'm like, I just don't, that just doesn't sit with me. But I do feel like there have been moments specifically for our more narrow brands like 2190, which is for women or Travel Noir, where we've tested, should we teach people things? Should we try to sell like travel guides? Mm. And it's hard to do at scale. I mean, it's not it's very hard. It's not actually that easy, you know. But to your point, there is this whole separate industry that was existing while we were building, which is all these 
coaches mm-hmm. and all the courses. Whole world. Whole world. And I have, you know, work smart and I do coaching and advising through that, but it's cyclical depending on how I'm feeling that year. Totally. Right? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of side project. Yeah, right. Yeah. But for those who do it full time, I mean, it's an entire industry. It's huge. It's really huge. So I'm really excited to see kind of where you guys take it. Yeah, I'm excited as well. I think we have to start diversifying out revenue beyond the sponsorship. The one thing I will say that is continuing to perform and grow is all festivals because it's fan driven. Yeah. And I think it's like we are content driven and education driven for women who want to up level. And like, yeah, we have celebrities and stuff, but like fans will spend like, and they won't even blink. I mean, look at Taylor Swift, Beyonce. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. So I do think it's like kind of trying to figure out the difference between like B to B to C to F to fan. Like how do we get to B? But I think there's probably people who travel to go to all the crates of Totally. Yeah, there are fans of like Crate and Cultivate too. It's just not at the fervor, I think, of like talent, you know? So I don't know. We'll see. We're going to get creative. We're going to figure it out. Luckily, we're like nimble and like able to do these kind of things now. So yeah, it's exciting. So from a time allocation perspective, how are you allocating your time? Are you going back to the old school Jacqueline where you were busting your ass all day every day? No, girl. Absolutely So what's not. going on? Okay. Walk me through it. So I am also the co-founder of Cherub, which we can talk about, but we I- We better talk about it. Yes! I'm an angel investor. Yes, girl. No, it's going so well. I'm excited. I'm really excited. So basically I have co-founder at that company. I have a CEO at Crate and Cultivate. And I was very upfront with both that I said, listen, like I can turn into a psycho. <laughs> like, You're intense. No, I can go hard. Yeah. And I don't want to do that, but I like, I will give you like the best version of myself. Like I know what I'm really good at and what I want to be doing. Half the stuff at Crate and Cultivate I was doing, I didn't want to do. It's like, you have to do it. Like you're wearing all the hats. So I, my roles are very specific at each different company. So I'm the chief creative officer at Crate and Cultivate. Like I handle programming, talent, uh, creative, ideation, all. Yeah. Yeah. Which is my favorite thing to do. I love it. I love events. I love it. I don't want to produce events, but I love events. So I'm like, we will hand all that stuff off. Marina's is admins, ops, you know, strategy, investors, right. all of that stuff. And then on the cherub side, Angeline's engineering product, like all the, you know, again, operations managing the team. Mm-hmm. And I am angel investor relations, marketing, events, all yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, go to market. Yeah. Go to market. So they're awesome. I think level setting those expectations and knowing it's been really fun. This is both their first like owned venture. So they're right. stoked and they're going in so hard, which I love to see. But I also feel like I'm like a coach in many ways. Yeah. It's like, you know, been there, done that. And so there's a lot of value in that as well. Yeah. You don't have to work as hard. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and I get to do as much as I want. I, I have my boundaries up. I know my limits. I'm like, you know, I want to cook meals. I want to work out. I want to, you know, have time to date. Like, right. you know, you have to make time for all that stuff. And I've tasted it now. So I'm like, I can't go back, you know, but I'm so excited about Cherub. Tell us about Cherub. Yes. I'm so excited to share all this stuff on Cherub. So Cherub is essentially a double-sided marketplace connecting angel investors and entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. kind of like a dating app. We call it Raya for deal flow. Mm -hmm. But this was something that actually came about while kind of coaching and angel investing, frankly. Mm -hmm. I have been angel investor for, I don't know, 10 years, 25 companies, blah, blah. And it's like a really shitty process on both ends, right? Founders have to cold email people and ask them for money. It's like the worst. Yeah. <laughs> and then if they say no, they're like, can you send it to your friends? Like, it's just this nightmare scenario. Most people honestly invest in people they know or friends of friends or whatever, right? Like, that's typically how it goes. And most of the people investing, Silicon Valley, LA, you know, former McKenzie Bay, like, you know, it's all like, it's Silicon Valley. Yeah. Extensions up. It, it's extensions up. Or you're a founder in the founder space right. and you have those connections. Right. And so it was interesting. I was hiking with Angeline and we've been friends for 15 plus years Mm -hmm. and she has an incredible story. She was at a YC backed company that was acquired by Open Door and then they went through an IPO. So she's had like the triple yeah, exit, made some really good money and we were hiking and I was like, oh, I got this angel deal you might be interested in. And I I would forward stuff. Yeah, you used to send stuff to me. Yeah, a little chain. Yeah. And she's like, oh my God, I would totally invest in that. And I was like, oh yeah, why didn't I think of you as like someone that would like, you know, angel invest? And she's like, yeah, I'm just because I'm not known. Like no one knows that I'm Yeah, she's not a brand. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, it's so interesting. I wonder how many people are out there like you. And she's like, no. Anyway, left. She sends me a text and is like, let's build a product. Because I think there's actually a lot. She did all this research and basically found out that less than 3% of accredited angel investors invest. 
Interesting. And I don't think that's because they don't want to. I think it's because they don't have access to deal flow. Yeah, we don't have the time. We don't have the time. How would you, you know, go know. look for deals? Exactly. Yeah, I'm not going to look for deals. Exactly. Try to give you money. hundred percent. me. <laughs> and I think the reality is, is like, and we joke that Cherub's in the business of warm intros, which is like worth so much because you go into it and it's a double opt-in and say, hey, I'm Morgan. I'm looking to invest in travel companies or yeah. AI or yeah. women or whatever. And then on their end, they're like, hey, we're looking for female angel investors. Right. And then you can match based on like that criteria. So we'll give you like, it's a 60% match. It's a 90% match. Right. You say you're interested. They say you're interested. Boom. You guys have the conversation and do a deal. Yeah. We've launched our alpha three months ago. Mm-hmm. We've since then had over a million dollars deployed to Cherub Brands from Which warm is incredible. intros. Because from an angel perspective, I mean, that's a lot of deals. That's a lot of deals. are investing like a million dollars, literally. They're investing 15, 50, 100, maybe 100. Yeah. Not even. No, 100, 100. We're seeing, it's awesome because we've seen some people deploy upwards of 150 to 250K single checks. Really? Single checks on the platform. That's major. And then 10 and, and 15 yeah. and stuff, which is great. And it's up to the founder to dictate their terms, right. like what's their lowest check size. But we had one company, uh, Nomadica Wines, raise $235,000 on the platform. I almost, I almost pulled that one. I love it. So fun. They did so well. So can you break down angel investing and what it means to be an accredited angel investor? Totally. So basically angel investing is when private individuals, sometimes family offices, sometimes like other things as well, but invest in private companies. And it's very risky. Oftentimes you don't see a return. Sometimes you do see a return. Yep. But what we are kind of likening it to and what we're seeing in the marketplace is I think angel investing, I mean, curious your thoughts on this, but like five years ago was very specific to certain cities. Whereas now I think it's way more mainstream. I think that angel investing has become more popular and more talked about. Exactly. And I think part of it is because of COVID, all the people who were like angel investors moved, not everybody, but people moved and that redistributed some of the money. So like People, like I moved to Nashville, people moved to Austin, people moved to Seattle, people moved to Denver, whatever. So now you've got these wealthy pods of people who have discretionary income that know the potential of investing in something and it being worth a billion dollars later and how you can take your 200K and how that can flip. But I actually don't even invest for the money return. I invest for the network. Return. Exactly. So this is what I was going to yeah. say. It's a network return. It's also akin to like a luxury purchase. And that's kind of what we're thinking about and how we're kind of framing the tech behind it. You know, Angeline's role at Open Listings and Open Door was your home purchase, the biggest purchase right. you're going to make in your life. So how do you right. get people to convert on that online, right? right? So that I think is so fascinating because now it's kind of like the voting with your dollars. Yeah. It's like I'm investing in women-owned businesses because I believe in them. And yes. great, if I make money back, awesome. Right. But I think people want to wear angel investments like a badge. Yeah. And that's what we're kind of you know hoping for. And that's a little bit of the emotional pull is I think people want to – you know, again, I guess like if I go, Morgan, who are you invested in? Where can I find that information? Maybe your website? There's no platform to see yeah. that. Whereas like on Cherub, you can have all your investments listed. Yeah. I can follow you as an investor and say, yeah. oh, I'm just curious what she's like investing in and yeah. follow that. In the same way you'd go on Zillow and look at houses when you're not buying because you're just Always. curious. Yes. Exactly. Nosy. Not curious. Nosy. Yes. Nosy. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So I think that's what we're tapping into from like an insight. Accredited investors. So this is sort of a guideline created by the government to protect people from making these types of investments. So typically I want to say you have to have an annual income, $250,000 as an individual. I think it's 350 as a couple combined. Mm -hmm. And then you could have like, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily salary. It could be like a net worth of like 2 million or 1 million. Basically it's the government saying like, don't be risky. Like you have have discretionary income in that way. So that's what accredited investors are. That's great. And what are you seeing from like angel investors who are onboarding onto the platform? What are the kind of deals that get people's attention? So it's really fascinating. It's all all that data. It's always so much data. And so all of our angel investors get access to that. We also have pro accounts as well because it's fascinating. I will say, and this, you know, partially probably because of my audience and community, but the million dollars that were deployed were deployed to BIPOC founded or women owned businesses. And I think that's by nature of the fact that like we're the least funded people on the planet. So I think that makes a lot of sense. But I'm I'm seeing CPG food and Bev is strong on the platform. People are writing checks to food and Bev left and right. Fascinating. I know. Well, I think there's a lot of beauty on, on the platform. I think people are investing, but I think people are getting nervous because I think there's been a ton of acquisitions in that 
that space already. Yeah, I Whereas agree. food, I think we need a sweep. We're going to see like a sweep in the I agree. Know, larger Nabisco. They have to. They have, have to. to. They have to to grow. Because we are all such more conscious consumers. Totally. Like I'm reading the back of everything right now. Like I used to be a Trader Joe's stan and now I go to Trader Joe's and I'm like, 30% of this we actually should not even eat. Like yeah. this shouldn't even exist. No, the things I ate in the 90s, like it's Breath. crazy. So bad. <laughs> so bad. Like fruit roll-ups, like what are we doing? Snack walls. Cheetos. I think about it all the time. Just like the diet culture of like, yeah. they're like, we're just going to put like, I don't know, fake aspartame and like it's everything. So it's so bad. But I would say those deals, also fintech. People are still, you know, really interested in fintech products. I think there's a lot of cool solutions that are coming out in that way. So it's been really, really fascinating. We just did an SPV with Francis Valentine. What's SPV? Uh, so it's a special purpose vehicle and it's really popular. Mm-hmm. Basically, what this means is if you're raising money as a company, uh, you have a cap table and that cap table lists all the different owners and ownership stakes in the business. So if you get a thousand investors at five dollars each, like your cap table is a mess. It's a nightmare. You do not do that. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so a way to kind of solve for that is an SPV where someone's going to create a company and an entity. Everyone invests in that entity. Right. And then their ownership in that entity breaks down into their investment into the larger company. So yes. it's one thing on your cap table. Right. It also allows for unaccredited investors to invest as well. Yeah. So you can write a smaller check and still feel part of the game in that way, which they're growing more and more popular. And there's platforms for that. Sidecar. Um, yeah, Sidecar. Sidecar. One of our work smarters, Kim Lewis, just did one. I think she's almost at a million dollars, but her SVB was run by Arlen Hamilton. Yeah. Right. So like sometimes you'll get like kind of celebrity investors who will set up an SVB and, and do it on and your behalf. Gwyneth and... Paltrow does it a lot. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. What platform does she use? Who or does knows? she do it on her own? She's probably on her own. Who knows? I don't know. Who knows? But I she's know. done it for I a bunch think, of companies. I think Gwyneth on the podcast. Oh, oh my God. Like, girl, what's going Let's on? Let's put it out there. No, I think she should there. do it. She's I'm going to on my Bobby era where you just put shit out there. It just happens. on the pod. No, I love it. I feel like she's more and more into the investing side of things. So yeah. I feel like it could be a really good fit. But yeah, I think it's fascinating. I think the thing that's so exciting is like we're seeing it happen in real time and we're proving out our thesis. I think the thing that's so interesting is 40% of the million were first time angel checks. Oh, that's awesome. So it's working. Yeah. Like they're getting deal flow. They would have never gotten their writing right. checks. They would have never written. Yeah. So we're proving out the concept in real time, which is exciting. That's dope. Let's go back to rebalancing your life mm-hmm. because like I think it's for me as someone who's still in it. Yeah. The idea of getting out of it and then going back to it in less than five years, I'm like, Stockholm syndrome? Like, <laughs> yeah, what's know. going on? Like, what, uh, like no, tell me sure. how you mentally got back there. Yeah. I think I am a type of person that thrives on ideation, creation, mm-hmm. you know, generating new ideas, new things, new businesses, all that stuff. I think I, in the step back that I took, I took a look at the things I really didn't love. And I think part of it was I worked myself into the ground and I didn't take any extra capital on. I did it all myself. It was blood, sweat and tears. And it was sacrificing weddings, birthdays, relationships, all of it for years and all for this one outcome I wanted, which I got. You got it. I got it. I did it. You did it. And then you're like, oh, wait, yes, it's amazing. To be able to go to work every day and it's not like with this giant, you know, elephant on your chest of like, I got to sell this thing. I got to make it happen. This is all, all I'm doing is for this thing. Right. It's different. Yeah. It's different. And it's heavy though when you have shareholders, investors, like all that stuff. I mean, it weighs on you. But like, I think for me, I come at it with such a different mindset and I know what I want. I don't want, I don't want to run teams. Like I've made that very, like, I don't want to do it. I'm good. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I overstand. Uh, Yeah. You overstand. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. And I think most founders are not great managers. Yeah. It's hard. It's a skill. It's a hard skill because you're just so used to doing it all yourself. Right challenging to pass down that information and create those systems and processes because you're just running at a thousand miles an hour. Absolutely. So, you know, luckily, like, again, both people are just like have come from corporate and have the systems and processes, you know, and I was 22 when I started my first company. So I was like, we go to Google Drive to drop yeah. off. Then you text me. You yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they have that dialed, which is awesome. But I think for me, the boundaries are, I think it's twofold. One is that I missed it Mm -hmm. and I missed parts of it. And when I came back, I was very specific about the parts I wanted to be part of. Mm. And two is like, 
I think I'd be lonely if I wasn't doing it, to be totally honest. You have a community. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I miss that. Like, I miss community. I miss you know, meeting people, like, you know, I think it can be isolating when you're not doing anything. And like, I think I had a lot of fun and I took a lot. I was like, but you can only go to Europe so many times. You know? <laughs> and then you're like, what a flex. <laughs> okay, we got to talk about, we got to talk about the money for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. when the money hit your bank account, what was like the most frivolous thing you bought? Besides a winery. No, oh. I mean, I mean, truly, that is, I always tell people this. I was like, I just spend money on travel and real estate. Like, okay. truly, like, I think... Honestly, the Napa house was like a huge flex. Like it, it, it was it's a like, flex. It's like a gigantic. I mean, it's a beautiful. It's like garden, six acres. It's on a vineyard. It's it's heaven. It's Being Nancy, delicious. It's Nancy Meyer's life. Yeah, like, I'm like loving it. It's awesome. So I think that was like a huge, a huge flex. I think I've always been really smart about real estate though, and like the way I did it. Right. But like I remember my banker being like, "You can make a fuck off real so estate fair. purchase." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I'm always like, I'm like, well, if I sell it, and you know, like doing all the things I do. Yeah, you know, the like, rationalization. Yeah, you can make a fuck off purchase. I love so, that. Yeah. Okay, and then what trip did you go on that was like, oh yeah, this is so, it? <laughs> I don't know if I saw this trip on his. Oh my god, no, you. It was on Instagram. So I went on a divorce moon. So basically, new thing. <laughs> I had had this trip booked with my ex to go to Greece and Italy and whatever. And it was booked, like tickets booked, everything booked. Yeah. And, you know, after everything had happened, I was like, okay, I'm going to go by myself. Still go. Yeah, Yeah, I was like, I'm going to go. All my girlfriends were like, no, you're not. We're We're coming coming with. They all rallied. Like, so I had a different girlfriend in each destination. Dope. I was gone for three weeks. Let's go. Living my best life. Yeah. Like, I was in Rome for like nine days. I was like, I'm just, yeah, I was, we went to Greece and Santorini and private boats. Like, we, it was a music video. (laughs) It was so, so fun. Yeah. We had the best time. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Those are really good. Yeah. And then what about daily lifestyle things? What are things that now you spend on? without the guilt that impact your daily life. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I've heard you talk about this on the podcast before, like really investing in things that free up your time. Mm -hmm. Like instead of buying a Birkin, like I would rather have someone that like helps me organize my life or like takes care of my house or whatever it might be. Yeah. All those different things. Cause it's like, that's the things that weighs you down. Mm -hmm. I think like the bougiest thing I probably have is like an estate manager. No (laughs) vibes. Let's go. Well, I I love it so much. I remember interviewing Martha Stewart and I was like, you know, what are you most proud of? And she's like, all seven of my houses. I was like, God bless. You know, I was like, yes, girl. I love it. We aspire to that level of ridiculous. It it was so amazing. I was like, listen, love this flex for you. But yeah, I think that because it's hard to take care of everything, especially now that I'm all alone. Yeah. That was a whole new world from going from like having a partner to do everything with from like house duties or this to like, this is all on me. So getting help on that stuff is definitely and a state manager is kind of like a house manager, but for the for yeah. the multitude of spaces. Exactly, and like I'm gone and back and yeah. forth, and it's like houses always have problems, right? To take care of like all that stuff. So good. I want us to talk more as women about the things and the people we have in our lives yeah. because I think so often people look and say she's got it all together. She's no. just doing it. Like this is just a <laughs> fabulous outfit, and it's like she might have had a stylist pick this out for her. No, it's a fabulous house. She has someone manage it. Like it's yeah. not just no. You know, we're not just brute forcing everything. No, you know? no. I mean, you can. You'll burn out. We did. Yeah, we did. We did that for a long time. Did that. Yeah. Move on. Exactly. You know. And my hope is that whatever that means for who's ever watching this can be just small, even if it's laundry pickup, even yeah. if it's meal delivery. Like it, makes it can such be a as small as possible, but like. It doesn't have to be so hard. Yeah. Yeah. And we, but we do that to ourselves. We do. Yeah. We do. Okay. So you're dating? Dating. Yes. It's such a weird. High powered (laughs) woman. Doesn't need a man for anything. Rough. Rough. (laughs) Rough. I need to hear about your story too, because I think, well, so what's interesting is like, I would say the most interesting part about dating and being 38 or whatever is like the younger men come out of the wood work. I was like so confused. I was like, come so, on. Okay. I mean, I'm here for these that. late 20 somethings. I'm like, okay. Here's late the, 20s. I know, girl. Oh, Tell me no, about baby, it. That's a little that it's might be so a little young. young. But here's the difference. And here's what I'll say. They don't have the hang-ups. Right. Um, they're not worried about nothing. Oh, uh, they're not worried about anything. They're yeah. so inspired. They're loving mm-hmm. it. So it's a different energy. Okay. And so I I know I'm, I'm you know, I'm tasting all the, the, the rainbow here, yeah. but it's really fascinating. Yeah. They're not intimidated. They could give a sh- they're so impressed. They're so excited. Yeah. They're eager. Same age range. Tough. Rough. Comparing. Comparing. 
insecurities, you know, and again, not everyone, but like tough. Yeah, tough. Older, better, because they're like, well, oh, you know, I've been there, done that. Yeah. Like you're, you're like, this great. is cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this totally. Is cute. This is fine. But the financials, it's rough. Like, you know, it, it definitely takes a very secure, confident person yes. to be with someone like us. Yes. And I think that's really hard to find. So tell me your ways. <laughs> I mean, one, I had to leave LA. Yeah, 100%. It's not happening here. And I had to tone down different parts of my energy. Okay. Like, I'm very masculine at work. We yeah, have to We're going to talk about it. We're gonna we had to be masculine, you know, and we had to be masculine to get to where we are today, to run teams, to have the resiliency, the grit, the mm-hmm. just like the kind of, all right, I got it. Energy, yeah. like, I got it. Because if we didn't have it, nobody no else had do it. it. No yeah. one else would do it. So, but that the doing is actually, in my opinion, a very masculine energy. Totally. Doing all the things. I can do it. I can open the door. I can find my own house. I can do it all. I don't need anything. I got it. Yep. That's not very enticing. No. <laughs> for a partnership at no. all. So I had to unlearn, like, to do less. Like, basically, just... That was my mantra, just do less. Like, literally just do less, sis, in my personal life. Yeah. Right? And so I had to create these different rituals and things that I did to, like, unwind and get into a space as I was dating so that I could do less. My do less was still on 10 for them. Yeah. No, you were normal. Like, like, (laughs) you were baseline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even baseline, you know? So, like, my ritual was, like, okay, if Josh was about to come over, I would, like, light all the candles in the house. I would like take a bath before, like I would put on pajamas, like something super comfy. Like yes. I would just like transition into a, just a softer space so that I was just less like hardcore. Yes. You know? This is so fascinating to me. So one of the girls in the blueprint, actually her name's Chica. She is a feminine energy coach. Mm. Anyway, we started talking about it and I had no idea even what that like was or yeah. whatever. And she was like, You've just gotten out of your masculine. I can tell. And it was interesting because I feel like the past year I was super feminine. I was working out, getting my nails done. I had time. I was like, I would get my hair done. I would shop. I would like think about the outfits I was going to wear and like roll out of bed like adrenaline, like like such a psycho, you know, and really like I love to cook and like, you know, doing all my little things. I love doing it. And I felt different Mm. and the energy was chiller and all these things. What I'll say is now that I've started to ramp up, you feel that creep back in and it is, I know. So I'm being, I'm really paying attention to it because it's hard to turn that down when all day you're like, yes, no, no, yes. Move this, that. Gotta go. Yeah. Gotta go. Gotta go. And then you have to go be like, <sighs> be one with the wind I with the know. sound and the smell if you guys aren't watching this if you're listening to this go to YouTube so you yes, can see yes. my hand motions <laughs> but like seriously I think I actually hired a feminine energy coach okay, cool. and I went through the process. different through the process because I didn't know I didn't know totally but I did know that the type of man that I was attracted to and the type of man that I was attracting were different Interesting. And what I really wanted in my life was to not think as hard at home. Yeah. Like decision fatigue. Right now we're sitting in a house that we rented in LA because we decided to spend time in LA. We're going back to Nashville. We've got to pack boxes and ship things and da da. I'm like, I don't do any of it. I won't do any of it. Yeah. You got it. And you're happy to have it. Yeah. That's the key is finding somebody who's happy to do the things that like, I'm like, I'm not interested in that. I don't care. I don't want to think about it. Like I will take care of the baby. I will like do whatever. Yeah. It's fine. And I think that as high powered women, it can be hard to find someone and then let them. Let them. Yeah. That's the key. Do it. Yeah. Because once you find them, if you don't let them, they're going to find someone else. They're going to, yeah. because they also want to provide value and they want to contribute to your life. And so if you're always doing everything, then what is their purpose? Yeah. Men need purpose. Yeah. You know? Interesting. Interesting. And so, yeah, I can see your brain. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, I love that. I, I mean, I think it's so true. Because I think that's what gets conflated is like when you're too masculine and then they, maybe you're in their feminine. Like, yeah. That just, then, oh, well. We can't have a man in their feminine. No. That's no fun. No fun. Yeah. No. And it's easy because sometimes you push them into it. And it's like. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a cycle. It's I do a think it's an ebb and a flow. It's a yin and a yang. It's a back and forth. And I feel like for women who are listening to this who are like, yes, I agree. Consider a feminine energy coach. Yeah. Just Google it. Put it in YouTube. 
watch the videos. They're very woo-woo. They're going to tell you to do really weird things, like go get your nails done. Or like the fact that we're both wearing black right now is like very masculine. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but we're doing a podcast and we're like boss we're women. We're in mode, Right? Yeah. But if we were – I wouldn't wear this. Yeah. I would wear like lighter things, flowier things, like, you know. Oh, my God. I'm so fascinated. Okay. So you're in your feminine. Yes. yes. Well, well, I'm trying, trying to be. be. Yeah. yeah. I'm speaking it into existence okay. for you. You're in your feminine Love era. It. Love it. And what are you looking for in this new phase of partnership? Yeah, I think like, I mean, everything's a learning, right? Like looking back on it. But I think I need someone who, well, my number one thing was makes me laugh. Like shit's so heavy when you're running companies. And if you don't have someone that you can just like laugh with. Fun. Have fun. Yeah. Someone that I can have fun with, number one. It's giving 28. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's giving 28-year-old energy. No. Like, uh, got it? I love it. <laughs> what else? I would say someone who is ambitious is, like, really right. important to me. Like, they don't need to be financially on the level, but, like, they have ambition. They have their own stuff going on. They mm. have their own life. They have friends. They're close to their family. Like, more value-driven, I would say, like, is really important to me than it was when I was dating in my late Course. 20s and things like that. Yeah. I think also, like, someone who's open to, like, a kind of nomadic lifestyle, right, of, like, living in L.A. or living in Napa or living elsewhere and, like, being open to that kind flexibility. of life. Flexibility. I would yeah. say is, like, important. I dated a guy that had a normal 9 to 5, and it was really difficult Rough. because I'm, like, I just don't live that way, yeah. you know? So I'm, like, oh, you have, like, two weeks vacation for real for real like, yeah like you can't work like literally you can't work remotely like oh this is a that's so, oh and that's hard for him in general sorry no like, he, he no. opted out actually he yeah. was like i can't i'm not gonna make the cut basically i was like you're not yeah you're not gonna make the cut. yeah thank you for bowing out it's no, painful because you're cute but yeah but it's it's real yeah. that's so real so i would definitely say that i think also like someone who is secure. Like, I think that's the biggest thing too. And that's, that's hard to suss out. Like secure attachment style, like by yes, true definition. Se secure attachment style by yeah. true definition. Also secure with themselves. Yeah. Like is fine being like, not a plus one, but like a plus one sometimes. Sure. You know what I mean? And like is good in a room and like can be on his own and not feel like I'm like babysitting or you right. know, whatever. That's important. Would you date someone who's divorced? Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Kids? Kids, definitely. Okay, so yeah, like the I'm world. Okay. The world yeah. is your oyster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you so, want kids? I always say it's very partner specific, I think. I'm not the type of person that's like, oh my God, I need to have kids no matter what. Like right. I will make it happen and, and I need my partner to have kids TikTok. Like I'm not like that at all. Right. I'm more like, oh, if like we together are an amazing unit and yeah. team and we're like, it would be so amazing to both of us to have a child. Yes. Then it's something I'm open to, but I'm also okay to go the other way. Big on the team. Big, Big on the team. Big on has the, to be. On the co-parenting. The co-parenting co has to be there. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Two of us yes. together. <laughs> because yeah, I'm not the person that's like, I need a kid to have a kid. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, I talk about it on the podcast all the time. I was like, could have gone left, could have gone right. Could have like, gone left, could have gone right. Yeah. You know, but yeah. it, what was important and the reason why it was a heck yes was because it was a partnership. partnership. Yeah. And I think that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm so excited for you. Yeah. I can't wait. It's, it's exciting. exciting. Will you have a public relationship this time around? <sighs> I don't know. You know what's funny is I didn't feel like my relationship was that public. Like I posted about it. You think it was? Okay. 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 No, that's good to know. That's good to know because, you know. I mean, I guess there's spectrums of public relationships. Well, you know, it's the wildest part. But you're not, like a, you're not like a dating influencer, but like public for. For, yeah, he was tagged and on yeah, things or whatever. But yeah. you know what's so funny? And I haven't told this to anyone, but like you'll appreciate this, is that. Uh, and we're still friends. Like, I should say, very amicable, very good friends. So we, we you know, got divorced. I didn't announce it or anything because I just felt like it was, like, so whatever. But, you know, we had been divorced, I guess, for, like, I don't know, six months, seven months. And he started dating Kesha. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's my favorite story. And then he posted the relationship with Kesha. So everyone just thought I got dumped for Kesha. Oh, and I was like, like, that's not fair. I was like, can I have gotten a heads up? Slack on the play. Can I have gotten a heads up? But it, now we joke. It's I like love that funny. for him, though. Yeah, no, it's hilarious. I literally was like, I need to be the cool ex-wife, okay? Like, <laughs> had Kesha. I know. I mean, kind of cool. No, it's kind of cool. I mean, listen, I was happy for him. I was like, damn. You are, are they still together? No. Okay, then. But yeah, but it was. I was like, okay, you get Kesha rebound? <laughs> like, 
You have some. I'm out here fighting for my life on these fighting streets. For, in these Napa streets, to be clear. Out here fighting for my life on this gorgeous property. <laughs> yeah. In just Central Bay. Yeah. <laughs> That's but the version I, of uh, rebound. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Truly, trips with your friends. Yeah. Like, fine. Yeah. But no, I loved it. I thought it was so funny. But then everyone was just like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm, yes, I'm fine. Yes. I mean, I did have to place. double act and I was like, are you single? Oh, single? single? Yeah. yeah. Because you're saying it, but you're not really saying it. No, I know. I, I tried to. Well, you know what was funny is like I actually got some pretty wild DMs because I, I didn't post it on the feed, but I did yeah, in stories. Right. And I got a few people that were like, were very disappointed. <gasps> not the judgment. The, the judgment, judgment was, was real. A few people were like, damn, I thought you were someone who really had it all or whatever. And I was sort of like that. Yeah. In, I mean, the internet's a wild place. I don't take anything personally, like whatever. And most people were very like, you know, sympathetic. But I think I was just sort of like, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'll go crazy public on the next one. It just puts too much pressure on it. Unless I'm like six years in and then like, sure, fine. Yeah. But I think it puts too much pressure on the situation. And yeah. I also don't want to be with someone who wants to be on the feed. Right. That's a whole nother thing. No. Yeah. I mean, I didn't post anything until it was like, oh, we're doing this forever yeah. kind of a yeah. thing. Because yeah. it's rough. Yeah. It's rough. Yeah. Early days and they're like. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. This is not your freaking yeah. party. Yeah. No. <laughs> not for you. <laughs> this is not for you. But I also, on the flip side, have dated a few people that are much larger, mm -hmm. like, influencer type people than I am, which is also, like, a funny. I like, but that would be so interesting. Yeah. It I've is never done it. Well, actually, not public figures. I've dated, like, athletes or whatever. Yeah. Well, same, same thing, kind yeah. of. But, yeah, it's interesting to be on that side, too. Yeah. You're there you're plus like, one. Yeah. Not mad at it. Not mad at it. Not mad at it. I'm a great plus one. So <laughs> listen. So anyone who is interested in Jackson, I know. Send her a deal. I'm like your brothers, your cousins. Throw them secure. In the You're secure. Attached. Funny. Okay, meet the criteria. Don't come here broke. Don't come here broke. But you know what's funny is a few people, a few girls. Like I love the Crane Cold community because they like DM me. They're like, listen, my cousin's cute. Here's his Instagram. If you're interested, let me know, girl. I'm like, yes, this, thank you. That's the energy we want. Thank you. Yeah. I'm it's excited good. for you. Well, yeah. thank you for sharing your journey with us today. This has been so fun. So just catching fun. up. Yeah. Hopefully for the listeners, you guys have learned more about angel investing. And also like, just know that the journey is never over. Like, mm. especially for me as a founder looking at you, I'm like, oh yeah, like, okay, when you exit, if we ever exit, there's still other things. Like, it's not done. Like, You're not done. No done. You know, totally. It looks like whatever you want it to look like. Right. And it's okay to run it back. Yep. Like, it's okay. Nothing has to be permanent. Like, it takes a lot of courage to say, I'm going to run it back. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I appreciate you. I'm excited to see what Create Cultivate does next. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.